Uh, and welcome to the State of the Bay Symposium. For those of you who were here earlier and got to see all the posters, thank you for seeing that. Um, and you know, with that, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of all these fine young scientists here. They're the, they're the boots on the ground and the fins in the water that really make it all happen. And I'll give a special shout out to um, longtime lab member Craig Shion. He's a, a jack of all trades. Just going to point out, he's going through some health struggles right now. And uh, so keep him in your thoughts as we move forward in the coming year. He's a really great guy. And uh, we'll all be thinking about him and pulling for him in the coming weeks and months as well. So on to the subject at hand, uh, and today talking about the state of the bays, we're going to think about the way that Long Island is a watershed, and uh, the water is the really at the soul of Long Island, uh, in that it's our drinking water source, and it's our livelihood and our coastal waters, and of course, all the activity on land eventually affects what is in the aquifer below our feet, it's our drinking water source, and what we happen to not extract, well, that's going to affect our surface waters. So all these things are intimately connected. Uh, and we know what the trends have been with regards to both the population on Long Island uh, and the concentrations of nitrogen in groundwater and specifically uh, nitrate. And I, I will be talking about the state of the bays, but I'm gonna linger on nitrate for a little bit. Um, you know, this is, you can't even read the bottom of this. This is different towns across Suffolk County. So it's by zip code. What it's meant to just show you that, you know, the average has gotten to around four milligrams per liter. And there's a lot of numbers above and below that. And you can see that both in the graph, bar graph, also across Suffolk County. Um, but the important thing is these, all these levels are very, very high. So this is a study by Duke University, it just came out a few years ago. And if you look at the y-axis on this plot here, you can see the numbers, the top bar, there's 200 million people. This is a study that really looked at almost the entire population of the United States to show that, well, most Americans have drinking water with low levels of nitrate, one milligram per liter or lower. Uh, the average of Suffolk County is much higher. Now, in prior years, if you've been to these, I brought up the point that there is emerging epidemiological evidence that links high levels of nitrate in drinking water with different types of cancers. And unfortunately, you can see all the references there. And if you see some of the recent ones, there's a lot of recent studies. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, these are epidemiological studies. But on the other hand, I want you to note the number there. The US EPA would tell you we should not have more than 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate in our drinking water. And that's to prevent something known as blue baby syndrome. But again, all these epidemiological studies are showing these effects at actually lower levels of nitrate. And this is really at a... Um, a a growing field. So this just shows you the number of papers that have come out on this topic through the years and the number of citations. Uh, and it's just simply to say that you can see nobody even thought about this in the 20th century, but this century, this is really a hot topic. Um, beyond that, unfortunately, another health issue to bring to light with regards to nitrate in groundwater is the potential effects it can have uh, with regards to uh, babies during gestation. Uh, and so this is an older study on this that was tipped off to me by Jamie Melliker. He's an epidemiologist at Stony Brook University Medical School. Um, and you can see here, again, not 10 milligrams per liter, but in the range that in which you see that higher levels of nitrate can be associated with birth defects. Now, this paper is somewhat dated, but uh, this paper just came out in the last year. And meta-analysis has probably, or some of you should know, meta means many, so it's a study, an analysis of many, many different studies, uh, putting them all together, and this study just came out this year, and you can see coming to very similar um, conclusions with regards to the effects of nitrate on, um, on babies as they're developing, and in this study, you can see there's multiple citations here, but this is a study of one million children in Denmark, uh, so a very, very robust study, and you can see all sorts of uh, adverse health outcomes, birth outcomes, uh, at the levels of nitrate that are allowable in drinking water. So I'm not here to shock people. I'm here to just share information and just simply say with this sort of information, knowing this, it puts the onus to try to have nitrate levels in groundwater for human health purposes as low as possible. 
Now, we know where the nitrogen's coming from in Suffolk County on Long Island, and in many studies that have been done from the, the eastern end of Long Island all the way through into Nassau County, the conclusion has been it's coming from wastewater. Um, and this has been done with many, many different models. Um, and specifically, the type of wastewater is uh, on-site wastewater. Uh, in Suffolk County, as probably many of you know, 70% of the homes uh, are not connected to sewage treatment plants. Very interesting green line there. I wonder if that's going to persist the whole talk. It seems like maybe it will. Um, so here's a map that I put out. Uh, this whole lab actually put out last September. This specific map is a snapshot in time. It shows just four months, June through September, and it documents the occurrence of different harmful algal blooms and areas with levels of oxygen below the New York State DEC standard. Uh, and what you can see is that whether you're looking at the east end, uh, the South Shore, the North Shore, to the uh, to the West, uh, all these locations had, were afflicted with different types of harmful algal blooms, and in some cases, uh, in many cases, also low oxygen conditions. What would happen if I got, did this? Sorry, that green thing's going to get to me. So let's just try one more time here, and make that thing go away. Okay, problem solved. So I do it again. <laughs> so with regards to these different types of harmful algal blooms, we can separate them into two different classes. Those that create toxins that can be um, have an adverse human health effect or affect even uh, pets or other animals. Uh, and then those that don't make toxins, but are what we know we can call ecosystem disruptive and can be therefore harmful to marine life fish and shellfish. Of these groups, I'm going to start out with these freshwater cyanobacterial blooms, also known as blue-green algae. Uh, and you're looking at, if you don't know the image already, this is Lake Agawam in Southampton Village. And you can see how the color of that ocean water contrasts with the lake water. Um, this system actually has been getting better with time, but it still is not good enough. And you can see that by this very recent picture. Um, but, you know, these events, again, are a concern because of the human health risks. Uh, the paper on the right there in the journal, um, uh, specifically calling out different specific carcinomas in China, that, would, that study is, it's not too recent, but it's recent in my mind, and it's one of the most comprehensive making the link between gastrointestinal cancers and, the, and microcystin in drinking water. Um, I won't go into the details, but the, the, the links are stronger than ever on that front. That's from the consumption of the water. Thankfully, here in Long Island, we're not drinking our surface waters. Um, but there are also other ecosystem effects. This paper was just published in the last year showing that this uh, event that occurred in 2020 with the die off of elephants in uh, the plains of Botswana was associated with ponds that seasonally get smaller as they evaporate. And when they get quite small, they have high levels of nutrients because the, there's not much volume left and they can develop these cyanobacterial blooms. And so the, uh, the die-off of the endangered elephants was attributed to those blooms. In addition, we know that these events can also poison uh, animals, specifically dogs. And you can see here the CDC study uh, affirming hundreds of cases that have occurred in the United States uh, through the years. And it's for that reason that DEC very carefully tracks these particular freshwater cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, the number of blooms that they've discovered through the years has increased, and you can see it's throughout the state. Um, but this plot here specifically shows an update for 2022. Uh, and specifically what we're looking at is the number of sites in counties across New York with these cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, and so firstly, I point out that there's 53 bars here, and there's 60 two counties in New York State. So that is to say that actually most counties are, re are reporting. So this is actually um, not necessarily a monitoring bias. All these different counties are looking. Um, but the number in Suffolk County exceeds those in these other counties. And what's of interest is that Nassau County, for the second year in a row, had no events whatsoever. And again, despite the fact that some people are looking. Um, and we might attribute that to on the one hand, we could attribute to Suffolk County because, well, it's warmer and these blooms also like warmer water, but most of Nassau County is sewer. And so you have two things going on there. One, less nutrient loading. And then two, there's just less fresh water uh, in total. So the lakes are smaller in uh, Nassau County. 
Um, and then beyond phosphorus, which we specifically do know can control these cyanobacterial blooms, uh, I published this paper a few years ago, making the connection between these events and nitrogen. And you see the idea of a dual role, and that's because the most common toxin, the one I pointed out before, microcystin, is a nitrogen-rich compound, and therefore this organism with more nitrogen ends up making more of this toxin. Moving to the marine waters now, we had a somewhat unusual event last summer. Week after week, through most of July and August, we continually saw a particular type of harmful algal bloom on the south shore here, uh, known as gymnodinium. And here's a picture there from Great South Bay. Now, these blooms look a lot like something else we've seen in the past called rust tide. And in fact, I, we had multiple reports out of Great South Bay and Mauritius Bay, people saying, oh, we're seeing rust tide. But when we actually got the samples, uh, it wasn't rust tide. It was a, you know, another dinoflagellate that looks quite similar. Um, now, but like cochlidinium, this has been associated with fish kills in the past. So in fact, one of the largest fish kills in New York, you can see it several years ago now, 2015, um, there was a significant fish kill across the Peconic Estuary. Uh, it all got concentrated in the Peconic River. You can see, you can kind of almost walk on the fish there. And there was a study done specifically of this event um, that was between the DEC, Suffolk County, I was also involved, uh, and attributed the, the cause of death, official cause of death, like an autopsy, uh, in part to the occurrence of gymnodinium. So that is, this is an extended fish kill over multiple weeks. This was the only dinoflagellate that was present in, during all particular points and times of the bloom. And in addition, we had done some work on the um, morbid fish, specifically looking at their gills. And what you're looking at here are fish during that fish kill. And all that brown there that is, uh, looks like mucus. There's, so this is, I should say, this is what's known as a gill lamella. You can see it here as well. These are finger-like projections that are important for the fish to breathe. Water goes over and allows, when they're like this, just like your intestines can absorb food, the finger-like projections can absorb oxygen uh, out of the water and also can excrete waste as needed. But here's the lamellae that, out of some of the fish that were in that bloom. You can see there's this huge layer of mucus preventing oxygen getting to the, um, to the lamellae. And you can see the, uh, um, this accumulation here of all those dinoflagellates causing and leading to that mucus. And in other cases, the lamellae were just, you can see here, they should look like this, but instead they're like this. Um, so even though we knew the oxygen levels were low, the fish even, you know, even if they were high, might not have been able to get at that oxygen. Staying in marine waters now, but moving from the micro to the macro, um, this is a new type of harmful algal bloom we've been tracking in recent years. Uh, this is on the South Shore, and specifically in Great South Bay. Um, and this is, you know, a case where when you see the water looks like this, you know something is amiss um, and not the kind of water you would want to jump into. And actually, so what you're looking at in the foreground here is actually the seaweed. Uh, but unfortunately, what happens is that seaweed, particularly if when it does get exposed and maybe begins to die off, releases all these pigments. And what we've discovered is it's not just that the pigments look bad, but they're not great for marine life either. Here's a few more images. When we first saw these, we figured this was red tide. But again, this is a little bit different. Red tides are typically individual microalgae cells. This is from a seaweed. Um, and we know, I've pointed out in the past, that there are lots of studies showing that, on the one hand, seaweeds, oh, they don't look good and they smell. But there have been studies. So, for example, in the this journal, The Lancet, is the second most impactful medical journal uh, on the planet and has made links between the overgrowth of seaweeds the decaying of those seaweeds and people getting ill because they can release hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, and that particular study was done in the Caribbean. I'm sure everybody's now everybody's heard of the, sorry, maybe you've heard of the sargassum blooms that are happening in the Caribbean. Uh, and so, you know, the, in the same way that those can wash up and can make the water look like this. And that study, again, I think they documented like 8,000 people going to the emergency room uh, on just one island in the Caribbean from that. Um, it's the same idea. And so we've had, this is from Great South Bay, and that same accumulation and production of hydrogen sulfide um, can be active there as well. So a few years ago, we documented the extent of uh, daisy siphon across the South Shore. Last year, we started doing more surveys uh, led by students in the lab. I see Cam is here. I don't see Lane here. Oh, no, Lane is there as well, who uh, 
leading up it, but many other people surveying. Uh, and what we're discovering is that it's actually now expanded. We're finding it on the North Shore. We're finding it in the Peconic Estuary, and we're finding it to the west, and this is even in Quantuck Bay. And again, not to repeat what I've showed in the last, but the, the species name here is Japonica. This is actually native to Japan, colonized Europe in the end of the 20th century, and has only been in North America for the last, if I'm not mistaken, 15 years. Um, and so it, clearly from this new survey that we did, starting to spread across Long Island also. We've shown this paper we published just last year that this particular seaweed, when it begins to decay and release those pigments, it releases a toxin called filarpin and can have ill effects, in fact, lethal effects on both larval fish and larval shellfish. Uh, and in a study we published the year before, we showed that this species grows faster when you grow it with more nitrogen. It grows faster when it has more CO2. And when you give it both of these things together, you can just about double its growth rates from ambient background conditions. And then we also use a technique where we're looking at the isotopic content of nitrogen in the seaweeds. This allows you by looking at that content, it's called the del N15 content. So that is most nitrogen on the planet is, uh, has an atomic weight of 14. Some have, there's a small percentage that's nitrogen 15. And by looking at the ratio of those two amounts, you can get a sense of where the nitrogen's coming from. So a high number, is associated with wastewater. A negative number is associated with fertilizer. Uh, and so if you're in an area with heavy fertilizer use, you'd see negative numbers. Instead, what we see is high signals that almost match wastewater. You can see it's telling us that between 75 and 100% of the nitrogen uh, original source is from wastewater. Uh, and so, you know, we've, we're in an era, we were in an era, um, in the end of the 20th century of record landings of clams and scallops uh, on Long Island. And we're in an era more recently of the onset of these different types of harmful algal blooms, freshwater, marine waters, microalgae, macroalgae. Um, so things have changed and the, you know, the fishery yields reflect that at least with, with regards to um, things like hard clams and scallops, which I'll talk about momentarily. And again, we've shown that the higher levels of nitrogen do lead to higher levels both of growth rate of these halves, but also toxin content. Just to go back to this map now and highlight a second event that occurred on the North Shore, but I think is worth highlighting, and that is some fish kills during summer. And you can see the cluster there, almost 50 fish kills uh, in the western part of Long Island Sound, the different harbors and bays there. Um, and in that particular case, you can see there's, there were these large dead zones that were out in Long Island Sound. These events were largely in, in, within uh, different harbors, Cold Spring Harbor, Oyster Bay, Huntington Harbor, Northport Harbor. Um, you can see some of the pictures. I think Tim Wong there was going out to the North Shore every week. And uh, I said, Tim, if you're there and you see a fish any dead fish, just you know, take a picture. And he, he was just in one particular location, but it was week after week for a month long period at these Western sites. Um, now in the past, we've documented that the mean level of oxygen or the DO minimum in these locations falls below the DEC standard uh, of three milligrams per liter. And so we had expected that eventually something like this could happen. But in last summer, particularly in August, you can see how low the oxygen levels were. We have loggers we put out all across Long Island. So this is uh, capturing the absolute minimum that happens 24 hours over a, a 20, well, uh, throughout the 24 hour period, but throughout the summer. Um, and so at the temperatures there, we'd expect oxygen levels to be at about seven milligrams per liter. The DEC wouldn't want to see levels before below 4.8 milligrams per liter. Their absolute acute minimum standard is three and none of these sites were making that standard in late summer. Um, and again, this is somewhat new news in that in the past, when people would measure oxygen, they'd go out during the day. And during the day, everything looked fine because there was lots of photosynthesis. In fact, I have some undergraduate students in my biological oceanography class here, and I taught about this today, where during the day with lots of photosynthesis, oxygen levels are good. So we were told actually for many years, no oxygen problem. But if you look at the measurements all the time, what you see is that from sundown until sunrise, the levels just continually drop down to these very low levels and, um, and they can have consequences. So to follow up on this, we undertook last summer 
And I guess Jen maybe is out in the room letting people in through Zoom. So Jen Galeski, we actually had a high school student help with this as well, Harry McKay. We're, we're sampling 25 locations or more than that every week anyway, but we specifically set up experiments, you could see all across Long Island where we collected water and set up very simple experiments where we collect the water, put it in bottles uh, and grow it either with nitrogen or phosphorus or both compounds, uh, grow it for 48 hours. And then after that 48 hours is the second step, transfer it from light bottles that were out in the light into dark bottles. And in this case, looking at the oxygen consumption. So in one experiment then, evaluating how does nitrogen and phosphorus in both compounds evaluate the growth of the algal communities and the consumption of oxygen. And so I have many graphs here uh, and I'm not gonna bore you with all of them, but I'm just gonna give you a, a sense um, of what they look like. Here are the graphs and here are the, the bars and what, anytime you see a red star, that's a significant increase. In this case, it's the amount of algal biomass during that first half of the experiment. And so what all these sites show is that with nitrogen on its own or with phosphorus, you're gonna significantly increase the amount of algal biomass during the experiment. And again, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but you can, and you can also see these in many cases are not necessarily small increases, hundreds of percent. Um, and so we did this on the Southeast part of Long Island, the Southwest, the East end, the North shore, and all these graphs look very, very similar. I'm gonna show you the details momentarily uh, or the summary momentarily, but the oxygen looked exactly the same. If you increase the amount of nitrogen that went into the bottles at the start, the rate at which they consumed oxygen significantly increased. And again, in the Southeast sites, the Southwest sites, the East end, the North shore. So if we look at these 25 sites, um, in every single experiment, more nitrogen increased the amount of algal blooms. Now we also did statistics. So we didn't always get a statistically significant increase in algal biomass, which is 92% of the sites. Um, but with regards to oxygen, again, the more this, the uh, treatments with more oxygen led to lower oxygen levels, and that was actually significant every single time. And on average, the algal biomass over just 48 hours went up 260%, and the decrease in oxygen was over 100%. So this is pretty consistent and robust findings um, that the nitrogen is universally contributing to more algal blooms and also declines in oxygen. I see Joyce Novak is here, the director of the Peconic Estuary Program, um, and Stony Brook and Somas is, uh, is happy to be working with the Peconic Estuary Program on different projects, and they specifically are supporting a project to look at the effects of nitrogen on harmful algal blooms in the Peconic Estuary. Kim Wong, again, was just presenting a poster on that uh, outside. Um, and the results there are quite similar. This is not, this was different from that other study, but same types of experiments. Uh, this is in Sag Harbor and very similar results. In this case, we drilled down to look at specific types of harmful algae. So in this particular case, uh, we had a situation where by adding nitrogen, the amount of alexandrium, which is a uh, toxic uh, paralytic shellfish poisoning causing dinoflagellate increased by two and a half fold uh, during a short experiment. And we also set up a new type of experimental approach where we diluted out the nutrients. And in doing that in a short period of time, this is for a different type of harmful algal bloom, specifically in this case, dinophysis, we could actually decrease the amount of dinophysis in the water by diluting down the nutrients. Um, and so, like I said, whether it's the East End or the South Shore or the North Shore, you know, there's a definite commonality in the occurrence of algal blooms in low oxygen with nitrogen. Okay, just to add another layer of things here and talk about some climate change issues. You've heard me probably use the term the Anthropocene now uh, in the past, an era where we have human activities dominating uh, essentially what's happening with regards to the environment. Uh, and as you can see in the quote, there being an overwhelming force in nature. Uh, so it's important as we think about our local estuaries that we interpret them through this global lens of climate change as well. We know how temperatures on this planet have been changing. Um, and even though it might look like we're at a little bit of a plateau there, bottom line is we've got, uh, I think it's seven or eight of the warmest years ever on record in the last seven or eight years. Uh, and I will say the interesting thing there from a global perspective, and I've said this before, but we had 
three years in a row. And again, my biological oceanography students are here. They're going to know this is great prep for your exam. Three years in a row of La Nina in the Pacific Ocean. La Nina is planet Earth blasting the air conditioning at as high as it can, bringing up cold ocean water to the surface at a rate that's much greater than average. And so despite the fact that we've been cooling the, a big part of the Pacific, the planet is still hitting these record temperatures. And the rate of temperature change here specifically is actually outpacing the global average uh, during summer. So when people think about climate change and people often hear about global changes in temperature, like here it says global averages, you know, the global averages frankly don't mean anything to a local ecosystem. It's all about a specific location. And the end, other interesting thing on top of that is that the changes are seasonal. So, you know, you can pick out different seasons and have just warming uh, that's specifically ascribed to a specific season. We're seeing the most warming during summer. So this is specifically looking at, um, I think, July, August temperatures. Uh, and this is using satellite-based temperatures. So this is a new way of looking at temperature. And so for Long Island Sound, this is literally thousands of data points for every day of the month for these two years. So very comprehensive and robust and a very clear signal that, you know, from the when this data set began, the levels were lower compared to what we see here. Certainly wiggle back and forth. Um, and, you know, probably in any given year, there are both, these are the combination of both global influences, but also we have to recognize that global ocean currents or local ocean currents are also influencing what happens here. Uh, so things like the Gulf Stream and also the Labrador Current coming from the north, all contributing to these changes. And Lucas, you're standing up now. I missed you before, but Lucas Chen also uh, helped a lot with those Pecanic X-ray experiments. Sorry about that, Lucas. Okay. But when we think about climate change, of course, it's not just the temperature. Um, we know concurrently that the oceans are acidifying. We know the oxygen levels are decreasing and we have harmful algal blooms occurring. Uh, and in the past, I've used these four conditions to be called the uh, four horsemen of the ocean climate change apocalypse. It's a little extreme. Uh, although I will say I put this up once and I had a group of NOAA scientists tell me they love this and they want me to put this out in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, I was actually was too shy to do that. So uh, I, I looked into it and I actually, I can explain why later, but I thought better of it. Uh, yeah. uh, but it gives you the sense of the, the, the things that we're thinking about. And so, and so the important thing being that there's a lot of things changing all at once and that it's not really just about the harmful algal blooms, but all these other stressors need to be under consideration at the same time. So to think about the scallop, uh, we know what's happened with the collapse of the scallops. I point out, and I've said this before, that the base scallop strain we have here is called the northern base scallop. So you can find scallops down to the Gulf of Mexico, but the strain that we have here is actually, we are the southern extent. So you find it here and you find it north of here. Um, and my former PhD student, Stephen Tomasetti, published this paper earlier this year, um, looking at how changes in temperature and oxygen affect this particular scallop. And you can see the second radiance there indicates that it's the northern bay scallop. Uh, and so he, this is also using that satellite-based temperature, essentially showing the increases in temperature that have been happening, uh, again, during summer, so significant increases. Um, all throughout this particular region. And uh, for those of you who know about the Napi Bay scallops that seem to be hanging on, it's notable that that is one area that seems to not be warming. Um, and of course, by laws of physics, again, taught in my class today to my students, that warmer water holds less oxygen. Uh, so we know oxygen is, happen is an issue as well. So Stephen did an experiment and you can see the results of the experiment. He put scallops out at four locations. They all died at one location. And I'll never forget, he called me shortly after, very sheepishly, very upset, and said, all that work in the experiment, and it was a failure. The scallops died. And I said to him, well, were your loggers working? He said, yeah. He said, it may all may not be lost. And of course, the, you know, that was a chapter of his PhD in a good publication. What he was able to demonstrate as the location where the scallops all perished experienced something called a marine heat wave. This is an actual term. So like the weatherman will say, for example, in the evening news, we've got a heat wave coming. 
In oceanography, a marine heat wave is specifically, as you can sort of see there, when you get above the 90th percentile of the mean long-term temperatures, right? And so you can see that's exactly what was hit shortly after the scallops were put out. And concurrently in the same location, as a consequence of those high temperatures, but also due to eutrophication, the plot here shows the uh, saturation of oxygen. So 100% uh, saturation would be that there's no effect of biology. This is the mean level, but here's the minimum. And you can see that minimum going almost to no oxygen at night. So the combination, it's not just the temperature, but the concurrent low levels of oxygen. And just to confirm that this may have been what was happening, Stephen did an experiment uh, with bay scallops from the Peconic estuary over a short period of time where in these upper two lines here, these are what we call survival curves. And so when he had them out, whether the oxygen level, the temperatures were moderate or high, and again, these are temperatures mimicking his field deployments, as long as the oxygen was high, they had decent survival. When the temperatures were moderate and the oxygen levels were low, well, he had 50% mortality. But when it was the combination of both matching what happened in the ecosystem setting, none of them survived. So sort of affirming his field observations. And then on top of the role of temperature and low oxygen, we also know that there are harmful algal blooms, specifically cochlidinium that we've published, can be lethal to the base scallop. Um, and blooms have not, not always been concurrent with the, the loss of scallop, so it's not the only reason. But again, it's an added, what we call an additive stressor. Uh, and you know the base scallop having problems with higher temperatures mimics another species that we lost uh, two decades ago because of high temperatures, and that's specifically the Long Island Sound lobster, where as temperatures rose for a while, landings increased, but once a threshold was exceeded, the, the fishery never recovered. Uh, and an interesting news, if you follow, uh, I don't know who would follow lobster landings in Maine besides myself, but um, the landings in Maine now as a state actually are not changed. But if you break it down by coastline, the landings in the southern part of Maine are declining while they're increasing to the north. Uh, and that actually happens to be one of the warming at an even greater rate of what we're seeing here. The Gulf of Maine is probably one of the, I heard, I've heard it said, I think at a meeting last week, it maybe is one of the warmest, warming at a faster rate than, I think the claim was any marine ecosystem, but it's warming very quickly. We could say that with confidence. Okay. So by now, I've probably put everybody into a terrible mood. Um, so let's see if we can't pick things up a bit. Um, so there was a study that came out last year. Uh, Mark Neff, this was actually a SOMAS graduate student. He did his master's thesis with uh, one of our former faculty, Anthony Dvarskis, at Cernobrook University. Um, when Mark finished, he, you can see he went on to the US EPA and working with other people, the EPA did this study specifically an economic study, trying to understand does water quality influence home values? And he specifically gathered data from the long-term monitoring data from Suffolk County and from the, guess whatever the real estate industry is here, uh, but had home sales for all the different towns as well uh, and put the data together uh, in an economic model. Here are the outcomes. I'm gonna show it in a graph here, but essentially what the, what he wanted to plot was if you increase water clarity by one foot, looking at all the data as a summary, how does that change home prices? So what you're looking at here is waterfront homes within 500 meters, 1,000 meters, 1,500 meters, 1,000 meters. And this is the increase in home price associated with clearer water. So if you're looking at it as a graph then uh, and converting it to just feet, this is what you'd get. So waterfront homes taking you know, an increase in value potentially of $30,000. Now, you know, those homes are worth more. That's a lot of money. I think and nobody would want to give that money away, but essentially just showing the economic value of having, in this case, it's clear water, right? But that clear water, the water clarity in our, in our estuaries is controlled by the amount of algae. Um, and you know, this, of course, says nothing to the fact that there are, uh, yeah. if you add up, recreational fisheries, commercial fisheries, tourism, that are also linked to 
clear water to yeah clear water and to uh, clean water. There's also some big um, economic incentives there as well. So, um, and I said, used this term before. If you didn't care about the human health and protecting uh, newborn babies, and you didn't care about coastal ecosystems, well, maybe at least you'll care about your home values. <laughs> okay, and then just to show how mitigating action can lead to improvements, here's a plot for Long Island Sound. Again, my undergraduate students saw this plot today. Um, and essentially what it shows is that during, uh, because of the 60% reduction in nitrogen loading, there are now significant areas of Long Island Sound oops, uh, that have significantly, that are not experiencing low oxygen um, during summer. And uh, this is the particular plot I wanted to linger on. I updated it for this year. I've shown this before. Um, but, you know, the particularly if you look at the data set, there's a lot of wiggle room in the beginning of the data set. But overall, the, the correlation between dropping loads of nitrogen and the shrinking of this dead zone um, are highly significant. Okay, so now to just talk a little bit about policy with regards to nitrogen loading. Here in Suffolk County, just a few years ago, the Suffolk County Subwatersheds Wastewater Plan was uh, passed. And I have the tagline here that's not from Suffolk County, but <laughs> that they technically went from worst to first with this policy. Worst in that up until this point in time, the mandate for every home, the way you had to take your wastewater and inject it into our aquifer. That was the rule. That was what Article 6 in the health code demanded that you do. But now, obviously, I, I, it's not a stretch to say that Suffolk County has the most progressive uh, on-site wastewater program um, of any county in the country. And so as part of that plan, um, you can see they made a priority for specific areas to upgrade septic systems. And note that this is not, if you, if you look at the lines here, these are not straight lines by any stretch of imagination. This is very carefully thought out. Where are the public water supplies? Right? Let's make sure we're protecting those. Where are the most impaired water bodies? Let's do a lot of protection there. That's why the South Shore, these very, very shallow bays, are, have the most upgrades. And then where are the areas that maybe we don't need to do as much? So on the north shore of eastern Long Island Sound, that water body is in good shape and that's not a high priority. So we can move on from there and really just go for things that are the highest priority. Um, and specifically, they currently there are multiple septic systems that can be installed uh, in Suffolk County. These are known as innovative oops, and alternative systems that remove nitrogen down below 19 milligrams per liter. And in happy news, there are lots of grants out there for upgrading these systems. And these grants are now not tax, not tax. They're tax exempt. There was a little bit of a legal struggle about this over the years. Um, and in addition, um, there's something that we may all have a chance to vote on this coming fall. Uh, we'll see if it comes out, but this is an op-ed that I had penned that was a Newsday last week. Um, about something called the Suffolk County Water Quality Restoration Act. And so with some luck, the lawmakers will allow us to vote on this coming this fall, but we'll have to wait and see. It's somehow attached to the budget, even though it has no budgetary consequence until the voters approve it. But the, the vote would be one eighth of a percent sales tax for water quality, for helping to continue to fund the Suffolk County um, septic upgrade program, septic improvement program. So at the university, I also direct the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology, where we're harnessing science to engineer clean water for the protection of public health and the environment in New York and beyond. And so we've been involved in coming up with new septic systems here. And our, um, our first set of systems we developed out of the gate are these nitrogen removing biofilters. These are near passive systems. They run on a single pump and the parts to make them run are PVC pipe, sand and wood chips. Uh, and in one particular case, also a, um, a vinyl liner to keep the wood chips in place and saturated. And in very happy news, our systems are doing very, very well. Um, they're being monitored by the county. These are all the different systems in blue, red and green that have been tested in Suffolk County. Uh, and the green are the ones that are already approved by Suffolk County and the blue are the ones that were tested but not approved. 
and you can see actually our line system is doing better than any of the other systems in Suffolk County. Our other system we have, it's called our um, uh, nitrogen removing biofilter wood chip box system, also doing quite well. We have a third one, not quite up to snuff, and so we're going back to the drawing board on that one. Um, but we're really proud of these other two doing almost doing better than and almost as good as any other system uh, in the county. And then beyond nitrogen, of course, there are other things coming out of the homes we worry about, emerging contaminants. And our systems can remove very high percentages of these emerging contaminants. And so you can see the percentages, they range from 50 to 100% removal. Um, these are percentages that are better than sewage treatment plants. Uh, and with regards to 1,4-dioxane, we're even very surprising uh, in that usually up until we had published a paper on this a few years ago, the thought was you could only remove it with something known as advanced oxidation processes. But the sand layer and these NRBs, as we call them, uh, is where all the action happens. And because we had the way we had them arranged with the sand filter, that is really where uh, what's helping to remove these compounds. And so in happy news, it says March 2023, it should say April at this point, but we've, we've, our, we've gone through the test for the line system and we're expecting this to be approved any day now, any second now. I've seen Julia here. I don't know if she's still here. So I think maybe she can give the thumbs up. I think any day, she's giving the thumbs up any day now uh, for approval. And we have two different installers who will be ready to approve these, um, install these systems. Uh, these are people who have already installed many of these actually all across Suffolk County when we went through our piloting uh, for these. Uh, our box system is being going through what's known as the piloting stage now, so that should be ready by next year. And while well, the online system, we're, like I said, putting our nose to the grindstone and looking for improvements. But we've got two system, one system that's ready to go and another one that will be right behind it. And uh, like I said, with installers lined up. So if you want to know more, um, well, you can ask me about it later. Um, we also have been doing work on something known as wood chip boxes. So this is uh, taking some of the technology from our wood chip box nitrogen removing biofilter uh, and linking that up with other approved IA systems to get the nitrogen levels down even further. Um, and we have a few of these installed. I won't go into the details here. These are levels of nitrate, but if you look at them, essentially what they're showing is we're getting already low levels. In some cases, it's low. Some other cases, not quite as low as you'd want. We're getting those levels down significantly further. If it's low to start with, we can get it almost to zero. If it's kind of high to start with, we can still get it down to very, very low levels, more than 90% reduction. Uh, and therefore, hopefully moving things to where we want them to be. Um, but the very last topic I'm going to cover today is the fact that as we deal with all these septic systems, we know that it's going to take time for groundwater that's finally getting clean to travel through the aquifer. Right? So that is to say what you're looking at here are known as groundwater travel times. So in the red would be areas where it takes 25 years for the groundwater flush through the system. Uh, and that would mean that essentially, even if you upgraded a, system, a home now in that particular area, that groundwater is going to, the, the groundwater that's had, had the nitrate or high levels of nitrogen in it will still be coming through for several years. So we need some what we call in the water solutions. And I just want to highlight two of those very briefly, uh, the first one has to do with shellfish, a sort of intuitive um, idea that if you have a lot of filter feeding bivalves, they can filter out the water, keep the water clear, and have benefits to the rest of the ecosystem. And we had a great example of this uh, in Shinnecock Bay. Some of you or many of you would be familiar with the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program, where we planted almost 5 million clams and uh, Mike Dole is here and should wave up his hand as a, a leader and uh, of this project here where we planted, uh, although many other people as well, like Tim Curtin and Brooke Morell and well, probably everybody has thrown a clam in the water at some point. Um, <laughs> where we specifically put out adult hard clams and the idea was to not just put in a lot of clams so they could filter the water, but take advantage of what we know about bivalves as in ecology we call an R-selected species. Two bivalves can have millions of offspring in just one year. And so over many, many years, if they can reproduce successfully, they can repopulate the bay. And so each of these locations represent what we call a hard clam spawner sanctuary with 50,000 clams packed into about a half an acre so that when the temperatures are right and they 
these what we call broadcast spawners throw their gametes in the water. They'll have successful fertilization uh, to make new claims. Uh, and we specifically chose areas where we knew the water would be circulating from these zones out across Western Shinnecock Bay and into Eastern Shinnecock Bay. And the outcome has been dramatic. So what you're looking at here are the densities of clams. And this is specifically Eastern Shinnecock Bay, but some eye popping numbers here. You can see where we were when we, I, we started with 2015 because our first plantings were in 2012 and we couldn't take credit for anything that happened before that. Right? But anything thereafter could have been because of the Heartland Spawner Sanctuaries. Uh, and you can see the enormous leap year by year. I don't have the citation up here, maybe it's in another slide, but we published a paper last year because we were, once we saw this, we said, oh, we have to publish it, right? So then the paper came out after this, and now this is what the data looks like this year. <laughs> so we, maybe we were a little early, but anyway, the, the results are good. And what we, the important point here is if you look at the colors of these bars, they're all young clams. These are clams that have been recently spawned in just the past few years that are recolonizing uh, from the recolonization of the bay. And Shinnecock Bay is unique. So Mike put this data together, looking at the different bays across the south shore of Long Island. We know we're doing, doing the restoration in Shinnecock Bay, and you can see the trajectory since we began in 2012. You know, the other bays are at steady state, maybe a little bit of increase, maybe a little bit of decrease. Uh, Shinnecock Bay started having the fewest clam landings and now is far greater than all the other estuaries, including Great South Bay, which is 10 times the aerial size of uh, Shinnecock Bay. With the increase in the number of clams, we I did calculations trying to figure out how quickly are the clams filtering the water, right? In the very beginning, the idea more clams could start filtering out the bay uh, and having an effect on water quality. And so if you follow the trajectories here, you know, in the West, we went from a three-week turnover time to just about a week. Uh, and in the East, well, months almost down to just a few weeks as well. So, we, but we're really most interested in the West because we know there's very good tidal flushing in the East. So, but in the West, again, a, a decrease to now just a matter of days. Uh, and we believe this is now enough for the bivalves, the clams, to have biological control over the estuary. And so with time, we see the levels of algae in the water in Chittagong Bay decreasing, the water clarity increasing. Um, We've seen the end of brown tide blooms, which were a chronic issue in Shinnecock Bay, as you can see here. Uh, we have not had a brown tide in the last five years. Um, and even this one in 2017 was not uh, anything very large or significant. Uh, and that's the longest time stretch, stretch of time we've had without a brown tide since they began in 1985. And this is from Brad Peterson's group showing the expansion of more than 400,000 acres of seagrass in the Western Shinnecock Bay during this time. Uh, and so again, the, with the concept being more bivalves filtering the water and having this positive effect, but also focusing on getting the clams to successfully reproduce and take advantage of that uh, ability to produce so many offspring in a given year. And then the last thing I'll mention is seaweeds uh, and figure out how kelp can help so we know that those seaweeds can take up CO2 and nitrogen, put off oxygen, and actually potentially fight against harmful algal blooms. Uh, and we know we've got, we want, we want out of our bays to have less nitrogen and CO2 and more oxygen. So this could be good. And again, Mike Dole has led the charge in getting out uh, growing, for example, sugar kelp on 10 different oyster farms across Long Island, 15 different sites from uh, New York City, all the way out to Fisher's Island. And, and look at the nitrogen we, that gets taken up. If you had a one acre farm, you could take up in a given year uh, up to 200 pounds of nitrogen. And you figure out that could be the equivalent of upgrading eight to 18 homes, uh, their IA systems. Um, so one of the big things we're trying to understand is when we think about those co-stressors, how they're affecting these different bivalves and what seaweeds can do about that. So beyond kelp, we've also looked at things like ulva, uh, and that's what you see here. And as a, just a very quick detour, but momentarily only, um, what you're looking at here is an oyster reef in Western Shinnecock Bay. Again, Mike, with all the help of the people here, helped install this. And uh, it's really spectacular. In the interest of time, I won't show a video, 
but it's just beaming with all sorts of life, including seaweeds. So this is that same oyster reef, but at the certain times of year, it gets colonized with seaweeds. Um, now that doesn't kill off the oysters. And in fact, it looks like it could have a positive effect. So here's um, those seaweeds and what it looks like underwater. I'm just gonna very briefly show this. One way we've been starting to look at uh, water quality to sort of map things out in high speed and high resolution has been our autonomous service vehicle here. This is the HiCat. Uh, so it's continuously measuring things like oxygen and pH um, and then logging the data back so we can, uh, with GPS coordinates, so we can make maps. And so uh, our oyster reefs that you saw there are on Sedge Island. These are levels of oxygen mapping through this area. And this is the area specifically of the oyster reef. So maybe a signal of oxygen here and uh, higher oxygen may be associated with the macroalgae. But when we specifically look at pH, we see a much bigger and broader signal. Uh, again, the highest levels of pH coincident with that oyster reef and also on an outgoing tide. So it seems to be a little bit of a halo effect. Mike's also put out other types of seaweed, specifically in this case, Ulva. And uh, Andrew Lindstrom's not here, but he's done a great job of running the high cat and making maps. So this is an array of Ulva that Mike had put out in North Fort Harbor and just showing that the levels of, uh, in this particular case, pH or higher in the zone where that aquaculture uh, over array was compared to a parallel control site. Uh, and we know that that can have benefits to bivalves, but really to nail that down, we started looking at uh, the ability of um, sugar kelp to fight this acidification. And this is an experiment we did last year on an oyster farm. If you can see, these are arrays of oysters being put out. Uh, and we put out experimental oysters with the kelp next to the kelp and far away from the kelp to look at what might be the effects. Uh, and we also had devices to measure the pH in the water. Uh, and so first you're looking at the pH, you can see the patterns here, higher levels of pH, we're measuring the area within the kelp compared to the control site. And I won't get into the weeds here, but suffice to say that we have some, what's known as coastal acidification happening at this site. Uh, but again, you can see the raising of the pH, um, specifically where the kelp is, and specifically in the beginning of the experiment, this is when the kelp was actually growing most actively. And the day-night highs and lows, it's just like we talked about with the oxygen uh, earlier. Uh, and the oysters grow faster with that higher pH, either on or next to the kelp, compared to a control site. And then you can measure that in a few different ways. And the very last thing that um, Lane Silvers has been looking at has been the way that seaweeds and specifically kelp can affect harmful algal blooms. Uh, she looked specifically at Alexandrium, which is one of the most dangerous of the harmful algal blooms, at least the paralytic shellfish poisoning, and can because the organism can make this um, neurotoxin, saxotoxin. And uh, one of the pictures that she took during that study, and you can see what happens to those cells, and it goes what we call chlorosis. So here is uh, the Alexandrium cells spilling their guts when exposed to specifically kelp. Uh, and an experiment where um, she'd put out uh, just exposed in Alexandrium some nutrients, a small effect in this particular case, but putting out a line of kelp in the same experiment, these were large tanks, uh, significantly reduced the amount of Alexandrium in that tank. Uh, and then I think finally, a final type of seaweed we've looked at has been Gracilaria and its effects on brown tides, which it had been over the years, a very persistent problem with shellfish in New York. Uh, and after just 48 hours, uh, former graduate student Colin Bennett um, leading this particular experiment, oops, uh, but you can see at a high level, just wiping out the amount of brown tide. And I should say, uh, Lane had done the calculations, we're only using levels of the seaweeds that we know are what we find on shallow water oyster farms. So on the seaweed front, the last thing I'm gonna talk, I'll just wrap up here, is that we maybe are able to create a halo effect. So we don't think seaweeds are gonna combat global climate change, right? And we're not gonna eradicate harmful algal blooms from an entire estuary just with seaweeds, but we may be able to protect an oyster farm. And specifically by co-deploying the seaweeds uh, with the shellfish, uh, lead to lower levels of harmful algal blooms, lower levels of toxicity within uh, the blooms, and then also combat ocean acidification uh, to the benefit of bivalves.
So that's it, wrapping up then, including excessive nitrogen loading from wastewater is an ongoing threat to coastal ecosystems, human health, and economies across Long Island. Climate change is accelerating, and along with nitrogen is having a compounding negative effect on coastal ecosystems and economies. Upgrading septic systems is a primary mechanism to uh, reverse, uh, to mitigate water quality impairment, reverse water quality, um, um, yeah, reverse water quality impairment, and remove nitrogen, but also potentially organic contaminants from drinking water. And finally, uh, seaweeds and shellfish are in the water solutions that can help as well. <laughs> so I thank everyone for their attention. Thank you. And would happily take questions. Yes. Uh, what type of wood chips do you use? Where do you get them from? And how long do they last in that box system? Yeah, great question. So um, we're usually using locally sourced wood chips. And so thus far, we found that oak, wood chips from oak, uh, seem to work best. And um, wood chips that are submerged in the absence of oxygen tend to last a really long time, like decades, maybe even hundreds of years. I know that might sound far-fetched, but um, I, I, I always tell the story. I guess I'll just say it again. The time I went to Denmark, went to a fjord, and they raised a Viking ship that was wooden. It was a thousand years old, and it looked like a Viking ship because the bottom of the fjord was an oxic. Um, and so, but on our wood chip box, Tom Barley is here, or was here, there he is. And so he's our watershed manager. And so he could tell you that the wood chip box itself actually is built such that if there were ever a problem with the wood chips, maybe the system got clogged or maybe we thought they were degrading or something else got in there, they could be taken out. Uh, not true for the two layer system, but for the wood chip box system, that is an option. Mm -hmm. Marianne. Um, do you have any plans or any thoughts to scale up the uh, PRBs or NRBs to handle something like Stormwater runoff more than just like a single resident. So, I mean, the wood we have thought about doing that with the wood chip boxes, for example, specifically to remove nitrates. Yeah. The one trick is that you need to scale it. We think we want at least 24 hours of what we call residence time in the boxes with the water. So you need to know how much water is coming, and then you need to essentially scale up that volume um to be able to accommodate that but we have we have considered that as a treatment option uh in some cases but you know we treat nitrate but might not treat some other things so yeah ship great talk again chris um what can you tell us about financial assistance opportunities for people who want to upgrade systems. Yeah, and again, Tom Barley, the watershed manager, knows this inside and out. But in the towns of East Hampton and South Hampton, you can get $20,000 from each town uh, through their programs. And then in addition, anybody in Suffolk County is eligible for $10,000 from the state and then $10,000 from the county. So all all said and done, in the towns of East Hampton and South Hampton, you could be eligible for up to $40,000 uh, in grants. And that should, in for simple installations, that could or should cover the entire cost. Um, and the deal in, in the towns of East Hampton and South Hampton are good because you can actually use the funds for even uh, property restoration. So your lawn's dug up, well, you can put in, get your lawn reseeded, for example. Um, if you bought into that, would the fraction of people who have access to the assistance go down? Or otherwise, why wouldn't everyone be taking advantage of us? Yeah, well, it's starting to happen and, and slowly, but um, and you know, there's a reason that East Hampton and South Hampton are far outpacing the rest of Long Island with on a per capita basis, uh, because they there's much essentially twice the funding available. Um, yeah, but people, it, it, it's happening. And, um, yeah. And again, that, that new act, the Suffolk County 
I'm going to get it wrong, but that new act is meant to put in a, a continual rev, rev, continual revenue stream so that the county's program would continue uh, uh, onward. And of course, Julie, if I said it, if, if you want to raise your hand and correct anything, by all means, okay, okay. How are we, John? Uh, two things. First, we, we've dropped our income uh, levels for uh, grants for IA assistance in the town of Southampton. So there's that. There's no income. Yeah, so which is great because, you know, some of the higher income people are, are right on some of the most sensitive water bodies. So we wouldn't would want that to uh, get in their way. For some reason, they didn't want to dig up their lawn. So right. Uh, anyway, uh, are you are you considering uh, oyster roots and seeding in other parts of Long Island, or more specifically, Southampton Town? <laughs> we are. Uh, in fact, a collaborative project with the Peconic Estuary Program. We're looking at some locations around North Haven, around Sag Harbor, around Shelter Island as well. And um, so we'll be doing some piloting work this summer to scout out good locations and um, and hopefully from there be able to do more. But uh, yeah, the, the oyster reefs, I just gave a quick example, but I'll just emphasize that Beyond, uh, you know, their filtration capacity, that each of them represents also a habitat. Um, so you can see all sorts of marine life within there and the ability to sequester carbon as well. Uh, yes. How much space do they take up compared to all of them? They take up more space for sure. And Tom, did I, I want to say, you want to give it a range? I want to say it depends. First, they're scaled per size of home. So your the, the number of bedrooms would dictate how large it has to be. Um, but it really, it's set up as a drain field. So it's like at least 10 by 20 feet. In some cases, can be larger even. Um, and so, it, again, scaled based on the size of the home. So in, And so they'll work for some, but not necessarily all uh, all properties. What does the CCWP stand for? What's the Center for Clean Water Technology. Uh, okay, and where is that? That's here. Or is... So it's a, actually it's a virtual center. So there's no building, but it's um, you know so there's different. I'm directing it, but there's different uh, faculty and scientists involved. We've got some of them here: uh, Caitlin and and Megan, Megan who made two trips to Southampton today. Here, one for sampling our NRBs, and now one to present her poster. Um, so that the, the weight of the center is uh, on the main campus. And it's between, I should say, civil engineering, chemical engineering, SOMAS, the medical school, chemistry, um, so lots of people working together. Thank you. Yeah, Marie. What's the difference between a PRB and an MLB? Right, so PRB is a permeable reactive barrier. NRB is a nitrogen removing biofilter. So PRBs are meant to treat groundwater flow, typically in areas that are near the coast, whereas the NRB is meant to be a standalone, innovative and alternative on-site septic system. But the commonality is that they both use wood chips for denitrification. For the PRB, that's, they, yeah, I, anyway, <laughs> I won't keep going. Yes. Two clouds of oysters versus clams when you're trying to um, seed them yeah. and get results? Great question. So when we began the Chicago Bay Restoration Program, we noted that actually there were not any native oysters in Shinnecock Bay. And so we knew that was gonna be an uphill battle. Um, in some places in the country, if you're gonna make an oyster reef, for example, all you need to do is put out shell. And there's so many oysters, the oysters that are around there will populate your, your shell that you've put out and you're done. Mike and I were at the National Shell Fisheries Association meeting in Baltimore last week. So our colleagues from the Chesapeake and from places like the Gulf of Mexico, they talk about oyster reefs and that's all they need to do. Um, and so, so with oysters, they filter a lot more water than a clam on a four to five to one basis. So on the one hand, you say, oh, let's get oysters, but they, um, you know, you, there's not a lot around. So you don't have the, with the clams, it was not as it was an uphill battle, but not as much because we knew there was some background population. Um, yeah, and then there's also the uh, the final thing I'll say is that we do know that oysters 
um, don't necessarily live, clams can live, we think, decades. Um, and oysters, for different reasons, predation, maybe disease as well, maybe don't, don't certainly don't live as long. And so uh, pluses and minuses, yeah. But both, we've had success with both. And as we move forward on both, with both populations, we learn about, you know, best practices, best locations, you know, things to do and what to do. Yeah, John. In, in your oyster reefs, um, are you monitoring for disease and are you seeing any advancement of disease as the reefs mature? Yes, so we do monitor for uh, Prochensis marina, which is dermo. And yes, as the oysters age, I was kind of alluding to that, they do develop uh, to the, the dermo, the Prochensis marina uh, does develop in the oysters to the point where after five years, probably they all have some dermo and sometimes um, it leading to, you know, manifesting as a disease that can even kill them all. Yes. Um, so I know you mentioned the kelp and I think that was in regards towards the carbon negative properties of it. But is there any MRV or any way to measure the amount of carbon that it would be doing? And does the kelp, the amount of kelp directly promote to better oyster health? Good questions. And so there's a few ways you can measure the carbon. And the, the simple way that we typically do it is that we seed the kelp. The kelp starts out microscopic. And we put it out in the winter, usually, or late fall. Um, the easiest way to do it is just watch it grow and then harvest it at the end of the season. And then we actually measure the amount of carbon in the kelp and have the weight. And therefore, we can say, OK, we've put out, the, you know, we've sequestered this much carbon. Um, and yeah, both in the lab and in the field, the oysters seem to grow better with the kelp. Um, in some cases, we, we do think if there's acidification, they could be helping in that case. There might even be some nutritional properties from the kelp that are beneficial to the oysters as well. Under questions, yeah. Are the species of kelp you're using, do they have the potential to become invasive? So they're native, thankfully, right? So they are native to New York. And when we grow the kelp to start our kelp growing on lines, Mike and his team collects kelp from Montauk or Long Island Sound. And so it is uh, thankfully non-invasive. Yeah. yeah. The uh, pharmaceutical trapping of the sand layer, how does that work? So it's, it's actually not trapping, it's actually microbial degradation. So as it turns out, the bacteria that actually degrade those, com those types of organic compounds are aerobic bacteria, right? So they don't occur where the wood chips are because there's no oxygen there. And but they really do well in the sand layer. They actually attach to the sand. So that's one of the reasons. They're attached to the sand. They need the oxygen. And you know, to get into the weeds a little bit, that wastewater has all the energy, you know, carbon that they need. Um, and so we found not only, so yeah, so that's where they are. And we've even found like the genes responsible for degrading some of these compounds. And I can't pull it off of the top of my head right now uh, in that layer. So it's definitely bacteri bacteria thriving on oxygen and attached to the sand. Yeah, Ed. Is there any commercial uses to the kelp once it's farmed? I know we're talking about uh, farming more and more kelp, but uh, as a commercial band and a fisherman and a trustee, I'm really curious if we can make it into a viable commercial enterprise. Yeah, that's well, that's really um, partly the trick. Um, so I, a few things I'll say on that front. One, um, I didn't present it this year, but in the past I've presented that we have used it as a fertilizer, both as a standalone, but also mixing with other seaweeds. Um, and it does show really good um, growth. And in fact, apparently that has been done for hundreds of years by uh, Native Americans. And so uh, there's that as a potential application. And there's at least one company that actually sells a kelp-based fertilizer here on the South Fork. Um, there are um, people who can use it for different uh, food products as well. Um, maybe not as a standalone, but it could be an additive. It could be a, a dried and added to something. So, but that's a developing field. That, well, that's a field that hasn't quite developed here also. Uh, and something that I'm interested in 
promoting, and I just haven't gotten to yet, is in my mind, I think people who grow kelp should be given some sort of, uh, should be given money, frankly, uh, and through a credit program. So for example, uh, in Europe, they give carbon credits for sequestering carbon. Here in New York, we're giving out money to upgrade septic systems and remove nitrogen. So if someone's farming kelp and that's removing nitrogen, perhaps there should be a nitrogen credit program. So it's something, uh, been a slow burn that I've been working on it, but I, do, I think there's room for that, particularly to get that industry moving along right, and get things started to incentivize people to begin to grow the kelp uh, while the commercial markets develop. Um, so I think that those are the sorts of things that I'm hopeful could um, encourage more people. So, and we do know this year, for example, there are uh, commercial oyster farmers who are growing kelp. So, okay, well, it's getting late. So I really appreciate everybody's attention and thank everybody for coming. So thank you.